but I'll just start by saying hello. Right, this has been recorded, so you're going to make me look really bad, so I'm going to try that again. Hello. Hi. Much better. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start. People can just keep coming in. Um, I was listening to uh, Haroon's keynote earlier, and I completely agree with him that we should make more stuff. Um, but I also feel quite, quite passionately that we should be, we should be making stuff better, uh, you know, and we should be making better stuff, and we should be making um, the lives of makers better, allow people to be happier uh, whilst, whilst making stuff. And really, for me, I believe that continuous delivery is, is really the only way to make making stuff truly sustainable. Um, and one of my observations over recent years has been that a lot of people treat, as the, treat continuous delivery as though it's a done deal. But when you actually talk to people, people are in all sorts of situations for all sorts of reasons. And so I really want to do a talk which is a little bit back to basics, uh, sort of, you know, not, not beginner stuff, but just re-looking really back and thinking, you know, taking that time out of the office to really think about why we do stuff and how we do it. Um, but, but who is this guy anyway? So um, I have a confession. My name is Phil, and I'm a consultant. Sorry. Consultants have a bad rep for a reason. Obviously, you get them going in and telling you what you already know and charging you for the um, for the mix. Thank you, charging you for that advice. Um, but I'm actually I, I, I love the job. I'm quite proud of what we do, and I feel like I'm really, really privileged at the amount of different places um, that I've been able to see. Uh, as a consultant and you know how many people just want to make great stuff and want to improve uh, what they're doing but but there are challenges to doing that um, I've seen the good the bad and the ugly and I am going to be talking about a couple of tales uh, that I've that I've witnessed uh, throughout this talk uh, I will warn you that names have been changed to protect the guilty so we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that um, but one thing that I sort of think that some consultants and some conference talks have in common is this So I think quite often consultants might just sort of say, this is what you should, this is what you should have. Why don't you have this? You know, wh why don't you just go to Mars? That's what you need to do, go to Mars. And sometimes conference talks can do the same thing. They'll show you a really nice, shiny thing, um, but they won't really tell you how to get there. So I wanted to do something which had uh, small steps, which maybe aren't that small. Um, and how many steps should there be? Has anybody read the title? What? How many? Six, thank you. Six steps, obviously. Uh, and because I'm, I'm not very nuanced and not very imaginative, I thought I'd, I'd show you six small steps to, to drawing an owl. And, um, you know, because we like to be empirical, I thought I'd, I'd test these, these six steps as well. So I am going to need rounds of applause for these because otherwise I'll get in trouble when I go back home. Uh, the first one is uh, by my son, Fraser, age 10. It's pretty good. There's some, some good uh, shading, some good shading, graduated shading there. Um, my, my daughter, Rebecca, age 12, very precise. I think she used a ruler to measure it. Uh, and thirdly, just goes to show that nothing, nothing, nothing is idiot proof. But obviously, we don't have any idiots in the room today. So we're going to talk about these six small steps. Portable checks, a baked brick, environment control, rollback, decouple, deploy, and release, production, intimacy. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Before we go into the details of these, though, we do need to talk about this. You see this all the time now, CI slash CD. You see it everywhere. You see it on job adverts. You see it on CVs. You see it on people talking about what they're doing. And I don't really know what it, what it means. Um, you know, there's one of the problems that we have in the industry, and I, I don't want to make this talk about a no true Scotsman talk. I'm not going to say, if you don't do X, you are not doing continuous delivery, or unless you do Y, you are, you are not doing this. But uh, one of the problems we do have in tech is that these terms that really mean something and mean something specific and precise get, get, get picked up, they get wrapped up, they, they get act as glitter, mainly for people who are selling things. So, uh, you know, exhibit A here. This, this is a quote that I took off Atlassian's public website. And it says, continuous integration, deployment, and delivery are three phases of an automated software release pipeline, including a DevOps pipeline. This is word soup. It's like a, an LLM gone wrong. I mean, what does software release pipeline, including a DevOps pipeline, even mean? I, I genuinely don't understand it. And this is a company that builds tools for people doing continuous delivery and has a really good engineering department themselves. I don't know how this how this happens. So we just know, need to go back to a, a source of truth for a minute. So 2010 Continuous Delivery Book by Jez Humble and, and Dave Farley. We're going to quickly go through a few terms. So CI, the parts before the slash, continuous integration. 
This is a practice. And continuous integration is really simple. It's only three things. Yep. Essentially, you are committing changes to source control at least once a day, ideally more frequently. Yep. Every change, and that's the two main line, trunk, no long-lived branches here, right? Secondly, when you commit, a build runs. Yep. And thirdly, when that build runs, the team prioritizes fixing failures. That is what CI is. Continuous integration is nothing more, nothing less. Deployment pipelines are a pattern. Again, it's quite simple. It's the idea that you actually have a machine that orchestrates and uh, shows you the status of pipelines. Rather than things just getting into production, you can see on a system, ideally with push button deploy, from the point that a commit gets made to it being in a production environment. It's just a deployment pipeline. And continuous delivery, which is what we're here to talk about today, is really a mindset as well as a bunch of practices and patterns. So great definition of continuous delivery. Deliver at a pace that satisfies customer needs. We need to think when we're writing software that we are thinking about customers' needs. It's not about us. You don't have to be deploying many times a day. You don't have to be deploying weekly to be doing continuous delivery, as long as you are delivering at a pace that, um, that satisfies customer needs. And really, it's quite a simple recipe. Integrate activities into the dev process, fully automate deployments. That is important, no matter how often you're, you're running them, but actually reducing the stress of releases. So most people here will have been involved. Show me if you've been involved in a big bang launch, many people, many months, or even years of work leading up to a big launch. How many people have done that? OK. Anybody that didn't raise your hands, make sure you talk today to the people who did, because it's not the place that you want to be. I mean, it's quite nice. You know, it's quite sort of exhilarating being involved in that firefight. So it's good for the ego to be the hero, yeah? But it's not sustainable, so it's not what we want to be doing. So I'm going to start with portable checks. But just before I talk about this, I've got a story. I've got a story for you. Um, so this was a project which we arrived on. It was a household name, at least in the UK. Um, and we turned up a bit of a rescue project. So they'd had a bad consultant previously who had delivered a massive platform which was causing them all sorts of problems. I won't go into all the horrors of that. But um, we, we went in. And one of the first things we often do is let's say, can we, can we build can we build the software? So I managed to get, get the source code out of version control. They were using version control, check. Um, I could not get it to build. Started talking to some of the developers, and everyone was giving me hush whispers. You need to speak to James. You need to speak to James. So I went around, and eventually I found the mythical James. Um, and I said to him, can you help me building this software? And he said, you need the dependencies. And he opened his desk drawer, and I shit you not, he handed me a USB stick. That is, not, that is not what we mean by portable. <laughs> I need another quick show of hands. How many people here started their professional software development this decade? So since 2020, in the last three and a half years. Just raise your hands if you started quite cool. OK, how many people in the last decade, between 10, 2010 and 2020? OK, cool. How many in the, the noughties, in the 2000s? That includes me. And have we got any that started coding professionally in the last millennium? Thank you for your service, soldiers. Um, this picture is from the Daimler Chrysler project in 1996-97. Uh, um, and it comes from Kent Beck's book, um, uh, Extreme Programming Explained, XP Explained. Um, and it's one of the first agile environments, really. Before agile term was coined, you can see uh, the boards in the background where they would have cards. You can see some people pairing, right? It's, it, it's all good. Um, this talk's not about agile or, or XP specifically. But I want to just read out a little bit um, the, the, of that book and experience. What this, and I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to get to the important part. They said, after a while, we look at the to-do card, and the only item on it is restructuring the other test cases. Things have gone smoothly, so we go ahead and restructure them, making sure they run when we finish. Now, the to-do list is empty. We notice that the integration machine is free. I'm going to stop here. They didn't say we went and checked the status page to see whether there were any builds running on the CI server. They said that we noticed the integration machine is free because it's there at the back of the room. So those people who were coding in the 90s will know that like people, teams then, the first integration servers, were people walking up and standing in a queue to load things onto the integration machine to make sure that it was working with everyone else's. So there was a real flow there. And what you could do before you did that, the more that you could do, the less likely you were going to go and have uh, an integration failure uh, and cause problems for yourself and everyone else. So think about this when we talk about portable checks. Uh, the way I always phrase it, we always say, can you, in your local build environment, can you work on the train? Can you make a code change? Assuming you've got the code, can you make a ch code change, verify it, and be relatively confident that it's going to work before you have to go and integrate? And there's a few things that you can think about here. 
One is manage runtime dependencies, and this is all about uh, maintaining flow state. So you want to be able to make your changes in a way that doesn't impact anyone else making their changes. It doesn't interrupt their flow state here. Yeah? It doesn't give them integration failures. And you want to be able to do it without relying on others. So if you cannot commit before you've run something against a service which has mutable data uh, and special accounts which are going to get out of sync because someone else ran something before you, you know, or if you, you know, require a dev service and they're making changes at the same time, things like that means that you don't have the confidence to work quickly and you don't have confidence that when you go to integration it's going to work. And interrupting that flow state is a, is a really sort of sad place to be in terms of working. Shifting quality left. Essentially, we talked in, in the continuous delivery slide about integrating activities into your dev processes. One of the things that this means is write tests and learn how to write better tests. Yeah? You, you, you will not get a better practice um, for, you know, for your, uh, your, your state of mind, uh, your mental health, than writing good tests and, and using them and getting better at doing that. But the reason this is checks, not tests, is it's not just about tests. Your, your compiler is a check. Uh, using linters is a check. You know, you can have uh, simulators, you can have diff programs, anything that you can run locally that reduces failures. So one of the practices you should have is if you ever get failures on continuous integration, you should say, what can we do locally that would have prevented that failure? Getting that feedback loop of improvement is what you really want to do. Shift the quality left, do things earlier. And whenever we do tests, prioritize on things that are fast running. Again, it's maintaining flow state. Whenever we talk about fast, um, fast tests, I always think of Corey Haynes. He, he wrote about four-second test runs back in, in 2014. It's still worth going and reading it. There'll be lots more state-of-the-art now. Um, but, but I love this. When He said, when people ask me how fast their test suite should be, my general answer is faster. So nobody needs to ask that question at the end now. OK, so step two. I'm slightly embarrassed by this one. I obviously, it's 2023, so I got ChatGPT to try and help me write this talk. Uh, there is a, uh, a talk later. Rudy is talking about ChatGPT at 3.40 this afternoon, if you're interested. Um, I asked it about the baked brick in continuous integration. And it told me that it's not a common term or concept. Uh, it might be a concept specific to a certain organization. So I think I might have actually made this up. Has anyone ever heard the term baked brick in terms of continuous integration? OK, so it's not Mandela effect. I made it up. OK, so that's OK. That's OK. We can run with this. Um, what we mean, really, by a baked brick is kind of a golden artifact. Yep. The idea that your build process will create a single unit, a single entity, which will then be used on every environment yep, and go all the way to production. Yep. So that golden artifact it has everything that is required for deployment, um, except for things that are environment specific and except, obviously, for secrets, which you all store in a mature secret management system. I know that's the case. <laughs> Having that golden artifact means that if something breaks in the artifact in any point in your pipeline, it is, it is gone. It is ruined. It is disposable. You throw it away, and the only way that you can get a new golden artifact is to do a new check into source control, create it again, and push it through your pipeline. Um, as well as a golden artifact, you should have a repeatable build. So if your golden artifact was lost with only a version control number, you can, you can reproduce that, right? So, so being able to reproduce that really means using version control well. Obviously, if you've got the version, you can check out from version control. It means contained dependencies. So obviously, everything that we build today, uh, unless you're in a very, very niche place, has a whole army of dependencies, right? It's built on the shoulders of giants uh, and on the shoulders of some not giants, but we use all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, this sort of practice, if anybody knows what this is, wildcard dependencies, this is a nightmare because what this means is it means the second time that you run the build, if any of those dependencies have been updated in, in, in the repository, you'll end up with a different version of the dependencies that you're running. That could cause, like, it could cause compile time breaks, it could cause runtime breaks, it could cause things that you don't discover, uh, you know, for, for years down the line. So, you know, no wildcard dependencies. You've got to manage the dependencies that you've got so that your, your baked brick is, is consistent and your repeatable build is con consistent. Um, and finally, a, a clean, clean build environment. So this is made much, much easier these days, obviously, with containerization. Um, but I've had so many situations in the past where a build server has, you know, somebody's hacked a build server to have local state, or you've got caches on a build server or something. You know, some way that state leaks from one build uh, to a later build. Uh, and that compromises your repeatable build, and it compromises your concept of a baked brick. So environment control. I have another eye-watering tale. Um, this was 
a, a production incident which we were trying to, um, trying to investigate. We'd had a bunch of production problems. Um, we'd kind of narrowed it down really close. We'd done a load of debugging. We kind of knew what the problem was. Um, but we could not reproduce it on any environment. And so we were like, OK, it's time to decompile some shit. So we went to the ops guys, and we got a download of the production system. And this was a, a J2E project, uh, sorry. Um, but we got all the jars. And instead of the jar being named System 2.1.1, it was called System K 2.1.1. What is this? So we went around the devs, said, does anybody know what this is? And one of them said, this is a K series jar. I kind of looked in blankly. I made it quite clear that I was going to need more. And he said, these are the ones that Kieran built. <laughs> so despite the fact that we had source control, we had builds, we had some elements of the deployment pipeline, somebody had somehow fixed something on their local machine, built it, got it onto a production service, completely uncontrolled. So what I mean by environment control is two things. I mean, control the environments you have, and secondly, control the environments you have. And I know what you're thinking, Phil short-circuited again, but really these are two separate things. One is to control which environments you have. How many people have been in or are in situations where you start off with saying, we've got dev, we've got test, we've got UAT, and we've got production. And then you end up with test one and test two. And then you get UAT and UAT two. And then we need a staging and a pre-production and a post-production, right? Yeah, I know, I feel your pain. Um, the, the cause of this is really end-to-end -end testing. So this is uh, my colleague Steve Smith, who wrote about this a, a long time ago. JB Rainsberg has actually updated his blog post just a few weeks ago on his original thing about integrated tests. And he says, I, 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 he, he feels like he, uh, his tone was not good, um, but he agrees with what, what he said. And th these are the things that are really worth looking at. The idea that you can end-to-end -end test complex systems kills any concept of continuous delivery. So you cannot have these big production environments, uh, uh, production, uh, you cannot have these big kind of environments where you're trying to integrate lots of different people uh, and, and they cannot be long lived. So when I said the control the environments that you have, I mean the actual environments that you have, how do you run those and how do you make sure that they don't turn in to these big kind of kept environments? And the first is to make them specific and disposable. So if you need to do a round of UAT testing, create an environment. And when the round of UAT testing is gone, kill the environment, throw it away, use it for a single purpose. Uh, you know, if you want to integrate with a partner, put up an environment, let them do some testing, and throw it away. That idea of creating, making environments disposable uh, prevents you from getting these things that you look after long term. Um, infrastructure as code, automation is, is brilliant. There's a, there's a talk this afternoon, I need to remind myself who's doing it. Um, Gabrielle's got a talk at the end of the day talking about how Kubernetes made their staging environment disappear. So you know, the availability of this sort of tooling now makes it so much easier. Uh, you can just say, give me, give me an environment. So as soon as you've done uh, a build step, you can automate it and ideally make it self-serve. Um, who knows why these pictures are relevant for this? Anybody want to shout out? Yes. Cattle, not pets. So this was a term used for servers. You know, I worked in a situation in the past where we had named servers, you know, Artemis. And we'd go, oh, Artemis has got a problem. And we'd go and care for Artemis. And we'd, we'd help Artemis get through this, this problem that it was having. And you'd, you'd, you'd kind of really start feeling affectionate towards them. Um, but obviously, the idea of, of infrastructure now is that you, you don't have pets. You have cattle, right? You, know, you, just, you, you get new things to the, to the herd when you need them. And you shrink the herd when you, uh, when, when you don't need them. And the same applies to environments if you're doing it right. It's not just to servers within an environment, but to environments themselves. You, you know, one day, you might have 15 environments. On another day, you might have zero. Your herd of environments should grow and shrink as you need them to. OK, so we're going to talk about rollback. A quick show of hands if you've heard of Dora. OK, not too many. OK, cool. So Dora is a DevOps research and assessment, as I said. Uh, it was founded by uh, Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humble, and Gene Kim, who also wrote the Accelerate book. Brilliant book. Um, it's most well known for the Dora metrics. So I'm going to quickly talk through the Dora metrics. These are really good things to be conscious of in your organization. Um, so first of all, we've got lead time. And lead time is the time it takes from you committing a piece of code to that code being put into production and actually used by, by real users. Uh, the second one is deploy frequency. How often is that process of going from uh, commit to a production launch happening? 
Um, you've got the time to restore. So if you have a problem in production, how long does it take you to get it back? You might see this called MTTR, mean time to recovery. Uh, and finally, change fail percentage. How many of those individual things fail? The great thing about Dora Metrics is that it comes from the State of DevOps report. Uh, so it's a big piece of research where they've asked lots and lots of teams around the world where they stand on each of those four measures. So you can measure them, you can go and look at the State of DevOps report, and you can get an idea of where you sit compared to the rest of the industry. Uh, and this has shifted massively you know, over the, over the last sort of five or 10 years in terms of where the industry are. There are a lot of people working at this really high. They used to have elite as well, but you know, you know, multiple, multiple releases a day. Uh, but actually, it's a long tail. There's a lot of people working in different places, but it's nice to know where you sit in the industry. When we talk about rollbacks, one of the problems is that lead time and deployment frequency really is about getting new stuff. Right? That's how often you're getting stuff to users. And change fail percentage and time to restore are about that stuff being available. What happens in a lot of organizations is that if there are problems, everybody looks at the change fail percentage. So everybody says, how can you stop having problems in production? Yep. But the problem is that normally means that you increase validation, you maybe increase gates, you add extra tests, extra approval steps. And actually, that means that you don't get new stuff. You'll see that your lead time will grow, you know, your deployment frequency will shrink. Uh, it's the wrong thing to focus on. But rollback is a, a time to restore mechanism, right? Obviously, there's time to restore in terms of defects as well, but we're focusing on rollback here. If you can release and, peop and, and demonstrate that you can roll back instantly with no effect, then you get much higher confidence, which means you're allowed to deploy even more frequently. And the more frequently that you deploy, the, the smaller the lead time is, the smaller the things that you release are, and the less likely you are to have problems. So there's a real virtuous cycle of focusing on time to restore over focusing on reducing the change fail percentage. Happy people. So four things that you can do in rollback. The first one is to limit scope. Yep. It's not rollback specific, but you know, if you've got a modular architecture, uh, the observant around you will notice I'm going to talk about separating deploy from release in a minute. But if you limit that scope, modular architecture, then the amount of things that you have to roll back is smaller. The likelihood of the need to roll back is smaller. So we'll say microservices, but it doesn't have to be microservices. But having something where you don't have to release everything at once makes sense. Um, be really conscious of databases, you know, especially schema-based databases. Ideally, apply deltas. Use tools to apply those deltas. And think about expanding contracts. So expanding contracts in architectural style, where you add new things uh, in, in live before you remove things that aren't needed. So it makes you more resilient uh, to having to roll back uh, changes. Any other states that you have? Uh, I've seen many things, many rollbacks fail because of other states, file stores, and things. You know, we can talk about backing up. You know, if you have not restored your backup, you do not have a backup. That is the golden rule of, uh, of backup. And also, don't forget roll forward. Roll forward is also an option, but this is a gambling term. Don't trace your losses. Most high-performing teams that I work with today never roll back. Yep, they roll forward now because they rarely have problems, and when they do, it's obvious than what's happened. They add a test, they fix it, the pipeline runs, it rolls forward. But they're not doing multiple. I've been in the bad old days where people are like, we can roll forward. And six hours later, you're on your 13th roll forward. So, so don't, don't do that. Go back to your rollback. Yeah, you've done that as well, haven't you? Um, so separating deploy and release. What I need to say here, you don't necessarily need a fully functioning feature flagging framework. Easy for you to say. Um, that's the thing we normally talk about with this. We talk about feature flagging. But I'm going to break it down in a few different ways. Because sometimes when you do have a fully functioning feature flagging framework, it doesn't actually do what you need it to do anyway. Yep. So I'm going to break it down in these three different ways. And the first is cohort selection. Yep. So normally, this is what we mean by separate and deploy and release. A really basic feature flag has two states. Yep. Either it's down and off. I'm really proud of that slide. Um, it's down and off, which means zero cohort gets it. Or it's up and on, in which case 100% of the cohort gets it. Now, that's good. right? It's better than not having anything at all. Because obviously, if you don't have any feature flagging at all, you do your deployment. And at that point, users suffer the consequences. But actually, if you separate the two, you do the deployment. And then at a later time, you give them the feature. It's two distinct sets of problems that you can separate. So it's good. But obviously, you can go further. You, know, you can use different amounts of different percentages of cohort. So you can have ramp ups. Uh, you can choose particular cohorts that you want to do it. You can do the classic thing where you just say, if it's got this particular query string parameter, assuming it's not a secure feature, then you know, our friends and family can use it and, and try it and do what they want to. There's lots of different ways you can use the cohort selection. Um, 
one of the other things you can do is, is roll, out, um, ro roll out code doing canary testing. So roll out to different parts of the infrastructure in order to hit different cohorts. And I'm going to plug another talk, actually, um, because Bongani is talking about canary tests later, although it's at the same time as Rudy. So it's this afternoon you'll have to choose between them. Unless, of course, you're watching this on the video, in which case, why not both? Um, the problem with doing infrastructure rollouts for, for cohort um, is, is, I'll explain in a minute, but basically I would try and separate them. So try and say, do an infrastructure rollout, but with the cohort selection off, and then do a cohort, cohort rollout. Um, and I'm going to explain this through a concept of dry run. So dry run basically means you've released something into production. Uh, it is being evaluated, but it isn't actually affecting user behavior. And this is uh, an incident that happened in 2019. So most people are probably aware of Cloudflare. Um, Cloudflare runs half the internet, certainly in 2019. It was huge. Um, they had an, an incident where they'd released a new um, matching piece of code, which was basically to select requests. So it was looking at a request. It was running a regular expression. You might know what's coming next. It was running a regular expression to say, should we select this? They rolled it out, and immediately, the regular expression consumed all of the CPU on all of their machines worldwide. They lost 80% of things worldwide for half an hour. Half an hour, good mean time to recovery there, but losing 80% of half the internet for half an hour is not great. Um, I'm not giving Cloudflare a hard time here, because actually they're brilliant. They've, they did a great blameless post-mortem. They published it really widely. That, those are things that you should do. But in that case, if they'd have first done, even though it was dry run, if they'd have first rolled it out to partial infrastructure, this wouldn't have happened. They would have seen that that particular infrastructure is spiking, and they would have been fine. So cohort selection dry runs. The other thing which is not really separate deploy and release, but I feel I should mention, is shadowing and teeing. So this is another case where you've got production traffic, and you tap some of that traffic off, hence teeing, um, and, and you run it on, a, on another environment, so with no real users on it. Uh, and the environment that you run it on could even be uh, you know, specific and disposable, maybe. So uh, it's a really good way, pre-actually releasing anything into production at all, so pre-doing an actual um, release, it's a way that you can deploy the code, you can evaluate some of it, but it's not affecting users at all. OK, we've been together for a while now, so we can talk about intimacy uh, between you and your, your production environment. I think when we're talking about this, it's impossible not to talk about observer. Sorry, I didn't even give you a trigger warning for that. Um, you can't talk about it without talking about observability. So obviously, observability is a, a term du jour, but it's a real example of what I talked about at the beginning. People have taken a term that means something really specific and retrofitted it to lots of past tech. Um, you can't talk about observability without talking about Honeycomb IO and charity majors. I strongly suggest you go and read. She's a prolific writer and presenter on observability stuff, and she knows the truth, um, and it's really worth looking at some of her stuff. Um, one of her big bugbears is uh, the amount of organizations that talk about logs, metrics, and traces being the three pillars of observability. Uh, it's mainly companies that provide software that supplies logs, metrics, and traces. Surprise, surprise. It's not. It's always been there. That's not observability, but it's a good place to be, right? You know, you need to really know what's going on in your production environment. So logs, metrics, and traces are great, but if you have to get a form signed in blood in triplicate in order to get access to logs, then you do not know how your software is running in production. So you've got to work towards being much closer to how those things run. Because you've really got to care for your users. You know, I'm a big fan of continuous delivery stretching all the way into, into a production environment. And the very, very best way you can really know what's going on in production and really care for your users is to run the services that you build. So you build it, you run it is a term that's been around for a few years. Um, we've got teams doing this in governments, you know, in large organizations, massive e-commerce. And those are the happiest teams that I've ever seen. You know, there's sometimes this myth that developers don't want to be involved with support. Uh, and they don't want to be involved in support if they're just doing support for other people's stuff. But actually, most people get the purpose from software of actually knowing how it's being used. And by actually being able to run that software as well, to me, it's the absolute best way um, to achieve what we talked about at the beginning. So you know, this is what we said we wanted continuous delivery to be. These are the things. You know, I've never seen teams more motivated uh, to integrate those things into the dev process when they know they're the ones who are dealing with support and they care about how that stuff happens. So I massively uh, suggest that you, you look at this. Before we wrap up, um, 
Robert mentioned feedback before. Um, the conference, as he said, is for you. So the only way the conference can get better uh, is, is if, you, if you rate people. Uh, obviously, we want to know the good and the bad. Uh, and I, for one, definitely wouldn't try and influence you in any way as to the feedback that you give when you go to this form. But just finally, I'm just going to wrap up. So the six steps that we've talked about offer to shift quality left, think of all the checks that might increase your confidence, and keep them fast. Have reproducible builds and use the same golden artifact in all environments. Avoid end-to-end -end testing and automate everything to have environments that are specific and disposable. Optimize for reducing time to recovery over eliminating change failures. Limit the scope of releases and gradually introduce changes to, co to cohorts of users and to infrastructure. Care about production, care about your users, and ideally run your service yourself. And now, it's up to you to do the rest. Thank you. I think we've actually got time for questions, which is a miracle. Hey, uh, at the start of the talk, you briefly mentioned mainline. And so what, what's your opinion on uh, branching strategies and how that plays into continuous deployment? I'm old-fashioned on this, so I don't know. I, I, I've, seen, I've seen people do Git flow and stuff well. Um, I think you can. I still think I've seen more people doing it badly. So I, I, I think uh, branching is fine, um, but I think short-lived branches. I think you, you shouldn't need long-lived branches unless your architecture isn't modular enough. You, know, you should create separation by uh, working quickly with... Um, with high cohesion on single modules of architecture rather than necessarily having um, kind of a, a, you know, a massive sprawling thing. To be fair, I haven't worked on a really high-functioning um, like monolithic source base. Um, I know that people do it. I I've not done that. Um, so maybe in that flow it's different. You know, if, you're, if you're working at Facebook's, on Facebook's monolith, maybe it's great or maybe it isn't, but I'd love to hear from that if anybody's, if anybody's worked on one. Is there ever a sensible trade-off for ergonomics versus local reproducibility? So let's, let's take a recent example. A lot of uh, serverless solutions, you can't really recreate locally. You can't, you can't code on a train. We're, we're seeing more and more and more of this come out. But when, what's a rule of thumb for when it's justified? to trade ergonomics off for not being able to, uh, to run your software on a train? I'm going to answer two questions there. The first is, is there a trade-off? And the answer is always yes, there's a trade-off. That's what we do as a job, is we manage trade-offs. So that definitely is the case. The example that you've given is brilliant, actually, and, and I completely agree. The, the, the can you work on a train, um, we've updated it, right? You know, it, it used to be, can you do it without connection? But really, it's about that integration thing. So with serverless, for example, um, I've not had great success with some of the libraries for running serverless stacks locally, and it's not the same even when you do that as what you're really running uh, on, on a cloud provider, so I don't recommend it. And I think that's absolutely fine. You are still on a train, just one that happens to have a good connection to the internet, right? Um, but the point is, is that you, what you don't do is have a single serverless stack that lots of different teams are trying to run against and integrate with, because otherwise then you have coupled state uh, and you, you create integration failures for each other. So that's a great example where you use infrastructure as code to spin up your serverless stack, run your tests from your local machine, and that's specific uh, and, um, and disposable stacks. With serverless, often it means you have a stack per developer um, when, you're, when you're working on, on local development. So thank you. Brilliant. Really good. So you really emphasized on um, having a feature top. So you really emphasize on having like a feature toggle on a live uh, environment, right? So my concerns are around a project size getting huge. We have like um, the project will take a hit on performance because now you're doing more checks. And I want to know at what point do you draw the line and say, okay, I'm going to remove all of those stuff that are slowing my project down because I don't need this switches anymore. Okay, so, so you're specifically talking about the performance at runtime of, of switching. Yeah. I, I, I think the, the glib answer is that if, if it's slowing down your performance, you're probably implementing your, 
your features wrong. There is definitely a complexity case. So uh, I talked about expand and contract. This is actually something also in, in development is you add multiple features with switching and then you take them away. But it, it really comes down to the, the, the framework that you were using. I think probably if you get to that point, you do want a fully featured a fully functioning feature flagging framework um, because you want something that can do that at runtime. But there's lots of different ways to implement that. You know, you can write something using the strategy pattern uh, and, and, and flip it through a configuration configuration item. Um, you, can, you can add a flag to a, a user principle in order to pick one or the other. But realistically, I don't think there's any modern or historic software development stack where the selection of a a feature for a given cohort should be a performance concern, unless you're doing some really ridiculously close to the metal high performance stuff. I don't think, but again, I'd love to hear. So wouldn't you say that having an infrastructure as code and are writing good automated tests solves the need for a feature toggle? No, no, I don't think it does. I don't think it does, because I think that's assuming that you can verify before production. Another talk I do is on testing in production. I'm a big fan of testing in production. It doesn't mean you don't do any testing before production, um, but I don't think it replaces it. I think they do different things. Testing before production raises your confidence, but it's that classic thing. The, the more you want to get to 100% confidence, the more you will spend, the more work that you will, you will do. Do you mind? We'll take another question. Thanks. But I have to talk to you afterwards if you've got others. Can you pass the mic back to the gentleman there? Hey. Hi. Thanks so much for the talk. Thank you. Um, my question is on the same theme. Um, it feels like if you have a lot of feature flags, it can be tempting for a developer to say, I'm not really sure this is going to work. Let's put it behind a feature flag. And you could have quite a slow rollout across cohorts. And in the end, you get this multidimensional problem where you could have 10 feature flags, 10 cohorts. That gives me a lot of different permutations for what code is actually running. So can you say something about managing that problem? Yeah, agreed. It's, it's, the, it's the same wider class problem as the over-configurable anti-pattern, right? which is that people say, oh, well, can we make this configurable? We don't know what we're going to want next. And you end up with uh, um, combinatorial logic, which means that you just end up with a huge variance. And that's definitely true with feature flags as well. So obviously, I was kind of on, on one side of it in this talk around how you should use feature, feature flags to get this. But I think team management is another. I think working closely with product, planning your, your feature, depending on whatever your definition of product is, planning your, your feature flags. And I, I definitely erred this on the side of, well, put the feature flag in there, roll it out really slowly. But again, really high performing teams can, with high confidence, get do a cohort rollout over an hour. Right? You know, if you've got the really high confidence that we're going to get the signals if something's wrong, then actually you can roll that out quickly. And I, it's, again, it's a great question. I do not advise, in the same way as I don't advise having long-running branches, I don't uh, advise having long-running split cohorts either. Uh, we might have time. Last one. Last one, I think. And then, because I'm eating into your moving time. Any, any others? We'll take one over here. Anyone else? Please grab me afterwards. Me? Oh, there you go. Yeah. So uh, my question is more on the side of, uh, yeah, obviously you want quick tests, quicker is better. And with your CI, if you have to have, is caching any uh, a good thing? Ne is it never a good thing? Is it good for increasing your tests? It's kind of a trade-off, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, so I, where, where, where I, I agree. So I think it, I think it's where it's where you have it's where you have caching. Okay. Yep. So I think if you have many, but many. So I talked about it in the context of build servers. If yep. you have many build servers with, I mean, if your if your cache is on dependencies that you're downloading, for example, yep. then it's fine because as as long as you aren't using wildcards and things, then actually the the, the request should match mm -hmm. what you get back, and and it's fine. But ideally, that cache is shared over all build servers, not local to a build server. Because okay. di the difficulty is when you get a build server behaving differently yeah, to another yeah. build server, that's the, the, the issue. So caching is fine in order to speed up your builds, but d don't allow it to cause variation between build servers. Okay, cool. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.